we're going to run a confirmatory factor analysis using the same data set that we use for the exploratory factor analysis video tutorial. And that's up here in the EFA section. Here's the data set. And I'm simply going to rename it confirmatory factor analysis. But there's the video on how we got here. And here are the items that list under each component. So this is what we're going to go by to run our confirmatory factor analysis. Let's go. So once you've opened up the file in SPSS, go ahead and go to Analyze. We're going to open up Amos. Step one, get the data. So I'm going to go ahead and open up the file. File name. Keep mine on my desktop. CFA right there. Important, don't have any missing data. Amos doesn't like missing data, so make sure none of the data is missing. Click OK. So now we have our data set loaded up. All right, we got one, two, three latent variables. Let's go ahead and build them. First thing you're going to do is click this icon. Now, be careful about making this too big, especially if you have a lot of items underneath one new factor it could get difficult and it won't show up very well on the screen so don't make these first latent variables too big and let's count how many of these we have for the first one one two three four five six seven for the first one so we go one two three four five six seven the next one had eight i believe one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Yep, and the last one had three. So this one's going to be eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And the last one had three. One, two, three. Now we're going to move these around a little bit. And we use our move them around. This rotates them. And I like mine on the left. We're going to use our little fire truck guy here to move them around. Get them all pretty. Actually, I'm going to stretch these out a little bit. So when the numbers show up for these correlations, they'll be able to see. And let me move these about. you got to hit this little red fire truck. Now, Amos does funny things sometimes. And just, you know, practice makes perfect. It's like playing a violin. So we're going to move them here and move these guys here and move these guys here. I like to keep them in a row there so they're nice and neat. What I'd like to do next is to go ahead and name these guys. So if you double click on that, on the new latent variable, it brings up objects properties box and you just name it. And since we're not sure what they're measuring, we're just going to call the first one first. Click on the second one, and we'll just name that one second. And you click on the third one, and we'll call that one third. So those are our three latent variables, construct variables, component, whatever you want to call them. And very cleverly named first, second, third. And we're going to covary them. I like to covary them just by doing this. You get the covariance aerial right there. You go, I want... First to second, first to third, get back in there. First to third, second to third. So every possible pairwise combination is there. It's not very pretty. That's why you use this magic wand here. And it'll shine it up for you. Nice. All right, now we're going to load up each item here. So we're going to go to this box. So here's all the variables, all your items. And I have to pull up the sheet. Give me a second here. I forgot which it goes where. Just draw that over here somewhere. All right. So item one has question five. 16 is next. 11. Six. 12. Eight and number th lucky number thirteen is the last one. Okay, next one uh, under factor two. It looks like seventeen, eighteen, two, ten, etc., etc. I'm gonna go ahead and move those over. 
17, 18, 2. You'll notice, real quick, you'll notice that 2, question 2 is a negative. It's the only negative one in there. So I'm thinking it probably might have been a, a, a like it should have been reverse coded or something. That is a very common mistake with researchers. They, they miss something that they should have recoded. And just watch out for that, okay? But I can tell you right now, question two is going to be a problem. And where were we? Question two, question ten. Fourteen. Three. One. Last but not least is question four. All right, that takes care of those guys. And then the dinky one down here, it's question 7, 9, and 15. 7, 9, and 15. Got it. All right, next thing we're going to do is we're going to fill in these, these little circles. These circles are actually error terms. It's pretty easy. Simply go to plugins up here. Name unobserved variables, and it gives you all your error terms. All right, now we got to fix the output tab. You're going to go to the analysis properties, and we're going to start with this one is always a default maximum likelihood. We want estimate means and intercepts, and I think those are all good. Numerical, don't mess with that. Bias, don't mess with that. Output, yeah, you're going to make some changes here. And uh, we need um, standardized estimates. Residual moments, modification indices. This is a biggie right there. That's the one that gives us all the, the numbers we want. And I believe that's about it. We don't care about the other stuff. And don't forget to save it. I suggest you save it frequently. And make sure it's in the right folder here. Hold on a second. Where did I put you? There you are right there. And we'll just call this CFA Video. AAA. I like to keep multiple copies there. And here comes the magic time. Hope it works, right? A lot of times if there's anything wrong with it, this is where the, the metal hits the pedal there. You're going to go ahead and hit the calculate button. And whistle a happy tune. What do you know? It looks like it worked here. All right, you'll notice that these loading factors are all over one. It's because they're unstandardized. you got to switch to the standardized estimates. And then the, these are their loading factors. So we're looking at them here. Not very impressive, I'm afraid. There are one, two that are seven or above. There's a 0.69. That's borderline. The rest of them are pretty bad. Which means that factor one under confirmatory factor analysis is not a good factor, even though it was under EFA. Looking at factor number two, I don't think it's much better. The loading factors are all under 0.7, which again means that even though they showed up together under EFA, they do not load up very well under CFA. So factor number two is not a good factor either. Let's look at the last one. Well, I'll be. This one is a good loader upper. You got 0 0.76, 0 0.80, 0 0.77. So all three of these do load up well. So the third factor does work well according to CFA. All right. Even though that we have determined that these aren't the greatest of uh, new factors because their loadings aren't that strong, this one is, but the other two are not, we're going to go ahead and look in the output. And don't be surprised if you see things that say that it's a good fit because there's, there's like five or six different indicators that will tell you if this thing can hold water or not. Let me get it on the same page. But you... Boo, 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 boo. All right, nice and neat. First thing we're going to do is go to the model fit. Boom. So your semen is your first indicator, but I it has been my experience that this thing is always significant. This is your chi-squared number, and what this is basically saying that there is a significant difference between your model, this model we're working on, and the, what they call the 
saturated model, what I call the perfect model. So in other words, your model does not fit the perfect model. Strike one, boom. And I know it has a lot to do with sample size, so, but let's keep going. Here's your fit indices, the main ones here. That used to be GFI. I don't know if this is a new version of GFI because this is version 26. I'll have to look into that and get back to you. But these are your fit indices. That's what the FI stands for, fit, fit, fit. And you want them to be over 0.9, and they all are. So that's pretty darn good. There's a couple other things we should check. We've got to look for the rim C. And this should be under 0.05. It's pretty darn close. But this one right here sinks your boat. This P-close should be over 0 0.05. I'll say that again. This P-close should be greater than 0 0.05, and the rim C should be under 0 0.05. So there's there's two, three more strikes. You're kind of out. So this P-close, let me try to explain it a little bit better. P-close. What this is testing is a null hypothesis that the rim C is not greater than 0 0.05. Say that again. The P-close is testing the null hypothesis that states that the rim C is not greater than 0.05, which means this, you reject that null, right, because the P-value is less than 0.05 here, which means that rim C is significantly greater than 0.05. And again, that sinks your model. But we're going we're gonna to check a couple other things real quick. We should have looked at the discriminant validity, and we could do that by looking at the picture. And we look at these these covariant numbers here. They should be they should be less than 0.5 roughly. But let's see if I can get a better picture of them. Let me see if I can't scroll up here. I missed the magnifying glass. My bad. So click. We want this bigger. We want this bigger. So magnify, magnify. Scoot over a little bit. Magnify, magnify. Scoot over a bit. All right, so it looks to me like from third to second is 0.67, too high. From first to second, see if I can't get this over there a little bit. Hold on, please hold. There she be. It's 0.83. Okay, so that's way too strongly correlated between the first and the second one. And between the first and the third one, this looks like an upside down 0.65. So again, your covariances are way too high. So you failed to prove discriminant validity. There's really no use going on anymore. It doesn't matter if we do convergent validity or not. But I'm going to make it official. I'm going to say that this model does not hold water. And again, for the last time, even though it came out under EFA, exploratory factor analysis, in this grouping method, it doesn't fit. Okay, it's not a good fit. And that is why if you're going to get an article published, you have to use CFA because the publishers will insist on using CFA. All right. So that's it. I hope it helps. MGZ out.